Hi, Belle. Hi, Sandy. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm okay. I'm looking forward to speaking to you because we've missed a week. Yeah, and it's very dark where you are. It is, but we are starting later than usual as well. Um, yes. But this week, I'll speaking of seeing, up. pretty dangerous. Ooh. Ooh. Wait, from is the, the, is the, from the, is the title, emphasis on pretty or dangerous? Well, from the title, what do you think we're going to look at? Uh, I, I honestly, based on the title, I don't know where you were going to go with this. And honestly, having seen a, 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 a examples of the artwork, I still am not exactly sure where we're going on this, but I'm going to follow you and we're going to say delightful, fun stuff about them. I don't know if we're going to say delightful, fun stuff about them. Because the thing I wonder about when I look at paintings like this one by Titian is I wonder who the woman really is. <laughs> and also, of course, the title gives rise to a whole kind of quite complex web of um, ideas and judgments about her. Do, do you mean the subjects themselves, like the models or the people they're portraying? Um, probably a bit of both, um, in that you and I have talked before about portraits. Again, I always go back to Wyeth's Helga, where there's a, an extraordinary sense of person. And yeah. that person has been important, significant in some way to the artist. Now, Titian most likely used Venetian courtesans as his models. Um, and he didn't necessarily have particularly deep relationships with them. Uh, yet when he's painted this character, her kind of forlorn beauty is so striking that it strikes me there's more to her than meets the eye. I don't Do you know think you though think. that that the you know Helga images were I think the first thing we looked at on one of these, right? Mm. Um, that the modern conception of the connection between artist and subject in a portrait didn't exist back then? Well, quite. I mean, you know, there wasn't necessarily personal relationship um, models. Yeah, I mean, Caravaggio what? always used the guy he uses in the Bacchus paintings. You know what I mean? Like that, he used mm. that one kid a lot. Maybe he was thought the guy was cute or something you know who knows right but but yeah i sometimes i wonder if we're put if we put a modern sensibility on things when we even think about the fact that he maybe he didn't even think about this woman other than the fact that she was in front of him to play a role in his painting mm. the reason why i chose the title pretty dangerous though is because i wanted to really think about the idea of almost like the femme fatale in art especially in kind of classical art or art that's not right up to the minute now. And the story Salome, people will be familiar with, danced at the banquet of the commanders and fancy folk at Herod's table, Herod her stepfather. And he said to her, if you dance for me, or he pleased, and she, was, she pleased them so greatly with her beauty and guile. And he said, I shall give you anything you want. And she says, I want, John the Baptist's head on a platter, please. <laughs> These stories. Yeah. Um, but actually it was her mother who had whispered in her ear that that is what she should have. So Salome has been portrayed in many different ways throughout the arts and culture over centuries, really. And she was particularly um, in focus again, I suppose, in the late Victorian period, we know that Oscar Wilde created this play, Salome, kind of a play on the, the, the character of this femme fatale. It was made into a movie, it was you know, a musical, um, but also her character rather played into the sense of um, the, the temptress, the seductress. And really, yeah. you know, she was just a girl who danced at the request of an extraordinarily powerful man. And in return for that, rather than making her own decision, and of course there are various accounts of this in different versions of the story, but 
one of the, the, the key or main versions of this story about Salome is that it was her mother who despised John the Baptist, who machinated and orchestrated the whole thing so that she could have him killed because actually Herod didn't mind John the Baptist. He was in prison. He wasn't going to execute him. And there are other versions actually, and it comes out in this Titian painting um, where there was a kind of implication that perhaps there was a, a, you know, not a relationship, but that Salome had encountered John the Baptist in his prison cell somehow, or had heard his voice and had been captivated by it and had grown fond of him or had even fallen in love with him. And that's represented in this painting by the, by the Cupid-like character that gazes up. Okay. I guess a number of things here. <laughs> One, how much do you think, uh, you know, a lot of the early Christian myth coming from Greek and Roman myth just being transmogrified into, you know, a new setting, right? That like, none of this stuff ever happened. This was just a way, uh, a parable uh, for, for what it's worth. But, but, you know, leaving in art only sort of two kinds of women, either they're innocent virgin, you know, beautiful women nymphs, or they are black widows, basically, you know. Mm -hmm. And very little in between. Um, well, I also would just like to say, kind of in response to exactly what you're talking about, in other versions of this event, um, there's the version by Caravaggio, for example. Yep. The young woman in the Caravaggio painting who holds the platter is young and bonny and blithe, a young woman who's beautiful. And in the background, there's a crone, a, a kind of shrunken, kind of creepy, scary looking old hag, um, who I wonder if she's intended to be a servant or if she's meant to be the mother or who she's meant to be. And, and here again, this idea that, you know, we've got the cupids in the, you can see them. And then we've got this looking up of this other character, like the surrounding characters Mm, support the sense of beauty in this case and actually yep. you know yes it's a religious painting but nonetheless it's Titian giving us a version of what a beauty would be in his time of his time um the the crones and the hags obviously never take center stage do they no because they're we've not never thought, we've as never visually that, interesting I guess hmm they're not as visually interesting. I don't know. Are they? Are they less interesting? I think that they are less interesting for the people who are paying for this kind of art. <laughs> you know? Because a lot, I mean, all this art was not done for the for the artist. This was all done for pat you know, for patrons, right? So mm -hmm. um it would be interesting one day for us as a as a, an exercise to take a particular story or setting and pull up four different artists versions of the same story and kind of compare and contrast. Yeah. I mean, I, I know that you keep suggesting things like this and we will come to it. I think when we've got more time, have I suggested that you've not suggested that exactly before you did say that you'd oh, quite okay. like us to look at, for example, Titian's work and look at maybe four or five paintings by Titian. Okay. Um, and also, again, sort of thematically, we could look at many different versions of depictions of Salome. I mean, she really has been yeah. depicted by lots of different people. Um, there was also a bit of uh, uncertainty. You know, we talked a little bit before we started recording about the crossover and convergence of stories, um, such as Judith beheading Holofernes, even in, you know, even in a way kind of, um, other fables connected again to this idea that a woman, I don't know if the word is triumphs, certainly in Judith's story, it's a triumph over you know, the kind of masculinity of the male power. And we've looked at a, a painting before um, 
where you know this idea of female power do you see this do you see this Salome, in this as as a, a female power i think she the, was only given power by the fact that she was beautiful and danced well all right i'm gonna throw you a bone what do you want kid you know i mean that's kind of what happened right well, in that way, it's rather, it's rather an ugly little story, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, Plus, the fact that somebody would want somebody else's head as a as reward. Like, you could have anything, kid. What do you want? I want that person's head. But, <laughs> you know, there's, messed up. there's a lot written about, you know, again, this idea that she didn't want that. You know, she didn't right. what she wanted. There's, a, again, a sense perhaps of a, like, a mindlessness about it, that she was manipulated Sure. Mm, and as a character through history who's been so, um, in so many ways, kind of vilified, um, pretty dangerous. Yes, she was dangerous because she was beautiful. But what else is there of her? Escape well, you could also her. argue that 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 if she is that, um, what is the word you just used uh, to describe her? Uh, if she can be manipulated that easily, that she's also kind of weak, right? You know, that like she's flawed in the sense that she's so easily manipulated um, by her mother or by her or whoever, you know, um, which, okay. which is also not a particularly strong character trait. Uh, I mean, these are all obviously manipulations and misogyny and early, mm. you know, mid-millennial European art and pasting that on top of Christianity from 1500 years before. I mean, you know, all of that is of course intertwined. Um, I mean, you could go all art school and talk about the, the, the red. Well, I, uh, I mean, we, we can talk about that actually because it's very important. Yeah, go it's, ahead. It's got nothing to do with art school. I think that anybody looking whether they've been to art school or not would immediately recognize if they're color sighted um, that that red is probably very important to this painting's meaning um and that also i mean kind of the background in terms of titian is that titian was a, a venetian school a renaissance venetian painter and so unlike the kind of mannerist style that was around in the rest of italy at the time um which really kind of focused on i guess line this is much more about color it was it was a titian was obsessed with color yeah although yeah. i wonder i wonder if this where is this painting do you know maybe the prado i'm not sure because i it just the 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 i wonder if that background is really that inky black or mm. if there's detail in there that just got lost in this reproduction i think there is detail in it it's very yeah. hard you know it's always for you and i looking at paintings especially very old paintings that um, I try, I do try and find the one that gives us the best sense of what the original would be like. But again, we've touched on this before. It's actually really, really difficult unless you've seen a painting in person to get any grasp at all on what this actually should look like. And um, unlike me, I haven't written down the size of this one, but I expect it's probably quite large too. Yeah, I mean, at least, you know, a meter and a half kind of thing. Size. The, the, yeah. the characters would be life size. Um, what do you think of her expression, Bill? Is that a familiar expression? Have you seen women you know with that look, that expression? <laughs> Only when you just went. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there we go. I, you know, one of the problems, problems. One of the one of the things about art in this period, or art in a lot of periods, but let's just say in this period is that I find the facial, um, I, don't, I don't get much out of most people's faces in, the, in, in a lot of these paintings. Like, I don't know that I, she looks very blank to me. I don't read her easily as having any feelings in one way or the other. It's sort of like a Mona Lisa kind of thing where it's like, well, I don't know what's going on in her head. If you disagree, you disagree. But like, I feel like if I was in a room and somebody looked like that, I would have no idea what they were thinking. But the fact that you don't 
well, the fact that you have no idea what they're thinking, of course, doesn't mean they're not thinking something. No, no, of course but not. But I, I but, it's but whether, if it's whether we care to know what this person is thinking. And I always find it fascinating that when we see this imagery and we're told this story over and over, as I said, through many different uh, paintings, we always see the head on the platter um in the you know the aftermath sure N never the actual decision which is actually the poignant moment I, I do wonder about it that moment at which she says the words i want his head on the platter i would love to know what she would look like then painted that would be that would have to be house. graphic art with a text bubble <laughs> Because you wouldn't know what you wouldn't know the story if if it didn't have the head in it. I, Mike. Okay, here's my question. Y yes, it's true that just because I can't read her doesn't mean she's not thinking something. Mm -hmm. But this is a painting, not real life. So if whoever made this painting wants me to understand what's going under her head, they got to give me something. Well, let's look at what they're giving you, right? Okay. So we've briefly touched on the, the red, that sumptuous fabric. Mm -hmm. We have that most delicate, I mean, I, I think it's truly extraordinary, the curl that falls down onto her arm, her fleshy arm. And um, we've got that beautiful open-throatedness, that blank space sure. at her neck, that most vulnerable jugular that is then exposed. I think this is a painting of such incredible yeah, but a, a jugular exposed to what? A, a a head that has no threat to her. You know. No, but the head on the platter represents the true danger to her. So I've called this pretty dangerous, and I, I kind of meant that in the sense that the women are the thing that are the danger to the wider kind of societal norms or cultural right. conventions, right? But actually, I think that Salome is in grave danger. And partly that is because you've already cited or thought that she may be weak and that that is a, you know, that's a dreadful kind of trait, character trait to have. However, right. she is a girl, she's a young girl. She's amongst incredibly powerful people. And those powerful people impress upon her their whims and desires. And that leaves her so totally vulnerable. And actually part of that possibly is to do with her beauty. It's to do with her beauty. There's there's I, no depiction of, of her where she's not represented as a woman of beauty. Yes, but my argument would be that in most paintings of the period, I don't think you'd find that many women, young women who weren't paintings well, of women of beauty. Indeed, we've got, you know, back to this idea, we either have the young beauty or we have the old hag. Right. I, you could also argue, though, that it's not that she's opening herself up to it, but she's actually just turning away and she's kind of disgusted by what it, what she's wrought. Mm -hmm. she's there's, like, a oh, God. there's a poem about her, actually, that took it a step further. And the story wasn't that she got John the Baptist's head on the platter because of her mother or because of, you know, like the machinations of the court. It was to do with her falling in love with a young sophist who she was trying to impress. Okay. And she, she just thought it would be so grand and great if she could bring the head of John the Baptist. And he refused it, this young man, and went back to reading Plato or something. Um, and so she, in a, in a fit of rage, thought that the, uh, he said to her something like, um, I would have preferred your head as a, as a joke. This is all in a poem and I wish I could remember yeah. who it's by. And she goes off and she tweaks off her own head and gets someone to take it to her. Is it take it to her? <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. Um, that's some dark stuff right there. That's dark. But, you know, isn't it all dark? We don't even well, have okay. to, you know. Here, here's a question for you. If, if, if Titian is painting what is a story with multiple variations and interpretations from the beginning. Yep. How much of it is, how much leeway do they have, especially in 1550, 
to actually interject what they actually think of this story or are they just representing it you know like i was going to say like painting a picture but yeah but but you know their job is to maybe they were told this is a story i want to tell and we read into what titian wanted when in reality it's just what whoever painted you know whoever asked for it wanted you know that that, that basically you know if you're telling the story of you know, Adam and Eve, well, there's got to be one woman and one man in the painting, because you know what I mean? It's not like you have all that much room. And there's probably a snake and an apple too. So mm -hmm. in this story, he's, he's just doing, he's basically just representing the story as he understands it. And he's not interjecting any sort of personal interpretation that gives us any sort of insight into what Titian's thinking, you know? Do we do that from, a, again, sort of the, the modern angle on it? Are we putting modern artist sensibilities on somebody from now 506 years ago? Do you think that there's a universal language of emotion? So like all humans, and all humans now and all humans ever. Yes, but have ex I do love yeah. in a remarkable, I mean, romantic love in a remarkably similar way, or have all humans, regardless of what period they've lived within, had the, the sense, the sensation of grief or fear? Are they universal? Uh, I think that those emotions are probably universal because they're biological to a large extent. However, the way that the people in different ages interpret those things, I mean, you know, people in 1870s London felt lust, but I don't think a lot of Victorians were thinking all that much about not feeling bad about, you know, wanting to sleep with their neighbor's wife or something like that. You know what I mean? Like that, 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 the, the view of how those emotions feel changes depending on the society that you're living in. So it could be that, yes, we think that, yeah, of course, yes, he, you know, he probably felt the same stuff we feel, but I don't know that he let the same things out or, or was able to feel the same way about the emotions he was feeling or, you know, could intellectualize them in the same way or did. Um, I mean, even look how different we are compared to two generations before us feeling the same sensations. You know, our grandparents, to a large extent, did not verbally emote the way we do about what's going on. Look at look at depression in society, right? You know what I mean? To take one thing, and the way that depression is characterized now, people felt the same way a hundred years ago. But I don't think a hundred years ago, you would have gotten the same level of sympathy from those around you for feeling that way. So I think that, yeah. But, okay, so tenderness is tenderness. Yeah, I don't know that that's true. Okay. Or I don't know that I agree. I mean. Do you see tenderness in this painting though? I see tenderness between the two living people. Do you see a tenderness applied to the head of John the Baptist? No, I see. The way it's been painted, Bill. Oh, the, pe the yes, of course, but, but maybe Titian was into the guy who, uh, you know, modeled for the head of the, by the way have you ever noticed that the john the baptist heads always look very similar in all the paintings that are of, of this subject matter mm, i mean i do wonder about the accounts of what these biblical and historical figures look like you know there are descriptions uh yeah. funnily enough with salome the description scholars you know she's described as a girl Sometimes she's in, in kind of some of the texts, she's just called a girl or the girl. Um, yeah, yeah. But 
yeah, again, there's the, the idea that she's she's described as um, you know having having a having a beauty. I mean, honestly, um, if 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 this actually if this has any historical you know reality to it, her name probably wasn't something that was remembered. No, that uh, and that that's yeah, so. that's the thing. Actually, um, you know, her mum was Herodias. Her, her, yeah, Herodias. Herodotus, can't remember. Um, and I think Salome sometimes is called the same name as her mother. And yep. it got too confusing, so they just gave her a different name. Again, that's another version of, of how we come to call her Salome. Um, I find her a fascinating character um, because so much is projected onto her about being this this you know, she's a vessel for actually a lot of here's a question for you do you find that you identify or project upon women in art more than men being a woman wow hmm. often Okay, but not always. Sometimes there's a sense of just floating with the. But isn't it interesting that when you pulled up that the Titian, the first thing I said was, "Wow, I hope I never that guy on the plate." Mm. I didn't identify with the young woman. I identified with the with the dead head. You identified with the dead head. Can that please be your sound bite for the show? <laughs> That's excellent. All right, here we are. Uh, how many years later? Uh, 400 years later? Yep. Well, not quite. Nearly. Edward Moore. Isn't it interesting that there was, there was probably, I mean, other than some very Baroque biblical stuff in the 18th century... <gasps> Yeah, probably a bit of a, uh, a, a bit of a, 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 a dead spot for female nudity in painting for a little while there. Say that bit again, Bill. I missed it. Uh, just saying that there was probably a bit of a, a bit of a valley for female nudity in paintings during a particular period. What do you mean? Well, I mean that that you know that that there were some of the more prudish times in like late 18th and early 19th century stuff, there's probably less naked people in paintings. Yeah, but I mean, the way artists got around that historically was rather than just saying, this is a woman, they had to right. make her into a nymph Madonna. or yes, a goddess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, right, you know. of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I just like overall, I bet you the numbers went down for a little while and then up towards the 20th century, probably more so. You don't, don't think so? Think so. No. All right, we're going to have to do an analysis. Um, I suppose like the Rococo art doesn't have a lot of nudity in adult yeah. females. This, uh, man, this one, there's a lot. There, talk about your red, your. Uh... Hmm. Well, Bill, in case you hadn't realized, I do think about what paintings I put together. You do? <laughs> I thought you just did a Google search. You're like, paintings for Bill this week. Imagine if you could type that into Google. Imagine. Imagine if you could type in paintings to discuss with Bill Wadman. <gasps> you know what? Have you Do tried? It. Try it now. <laughs> anyway, Monk, most famously yeah. known for The Scream. Sure. Which is probably, you know, it's one of the most famous paintings in the world. It's an image that's recognized. I walk into a year seven class full of 11 year olds that I've never seen before in my life. And I can say, do you all know the scream? And actually they might not know some of them, the Mona Lisa, but they'll know the scream for some reason. They, it know, really has they know the scream over the Mona Lisa? Uh, that it's really penetrated the minds of people. Okay. Um, it really has. Anyway, this one, lesser known, but nonetheless still very famous. And there are many versions of this monk was prolific um, printer etcher um, 
this one is the old painting version. This one is in Oslo. I mean, Monk is a, a Norwegian painter. It's right. called Madonna. Um, again, it does have various other titles, but Madonna is the one that comes through the most. Um, and this was completed somewhere between 1892 and 1895. Um, it is an extraordinarily powerful painting. What and do you I like mean, about it? I think I like the fact that we may see that this is a reclining female in her ecstasy, or oh, we could okay. see, or we could see that this is a rising demon female above us who is going to kind of overwhelm us. Both, both, both ways are kind of overwhelming. And again, looking at the date and thinking about the context of the time, it was a hugely reactionary period it's the kind of um, burgeoning sense of, well, what we would then come to think of a female emancipation movement. Yeah. Um, and the sense that there was, or a perception culturally that, uh, you know, masculine power was perhaps struggling a little bit, that, that suddenly women were being acknowledged for actually being powerful. Mm. Do you, it's do you, I mean, you could almost see her coming up out of water too, just the way her arms get lost into depth, you know? Yeah, do you see her as reclining or rising? Rising. I and mean, also, can, can, can I make a more avant-garde analysis? You, avant-garde, are you sure? Well, is there also something about the background and that she's sitting in that is sort of vaginal? Yes, and also, again, I, I just mentioned a moment ago, Madonna is a really subversive title for this because, yeah. you know, here we are, Mother of Christ, or do we have... Um, kind of like an autoerotic right i don't see a whole lot of mother of christ in this photograph well painting um a painting yeah it's titled Sorry. madonna yeah um and, but this this mark making around the outside there's something quite blakish about it yep um, yes yes but also again in context of the title madonna thinking about depictions of uh mary in other paintings with the golden halo, this then becomes the red halo. And some people might interpret that to mean uh, certainly, you know, a particularly female thing. And in both paintings, actually, the, the red color is something of that femaleness, of that power. And if not perceived in the background, almost like a, a vagina, it could be that it's, really to do with with fertility with the blood of menstruation with sure um death and in a lot of monks painting there's a, a tension between lust death there's an interplay between the roles of um desire and mourning and grief uh tragedy loss um, I mean, uh, thinking about whether it's reclining or whether it's rising, you know, this is powerful or is it submissive? Or is there a power in that submission actually? Um, something that's profane or something that's sacred? Again, the title would imply this ought to be something of, of, of the sacred. And yet for its time, this title with this imagery hugely subversive and profane yeah do you see her, uh it's also interesting the other reason i think the water you see the way the water is sort of rippling below her abdomen mm. that also i mean i have shot people in tubs before from above yeah and like that's how it all looks you know um do you, do you see her disconnected or from the back 
background? Like, do you see the background and she as two separate elements that have been stuck together or that this is a visual representation of what Monk was seeing or, or he wanted her in that environment? Do you, you know what I'm saying? I think she operates as one. Yeah. I think also that's to do with um, Monk was very much part of a symbolist tradition. And he issued rather the more impression impressionist style, which was really to look at interplay of light on the external world, on the physical world, whereas he was looking within right. all the time. Um, and we see that in, in all his paintings, even in what might appear to be the simplest self-portrait. It's not. There's something deeply brooding and dark. I mean, Monk's life was marred by tragedy. Anyone who, who knows anything about him, there was a fabulous um, exhibition at Tate Modern a few years ago. You know, a very uh, unusual character, again, marred by tragedy, but also by kind of like the spectre of mental illness. Uh, his mother died when he was very young, his older sister died, um, sister was incarcerated. In fact, actually, some people say that the scream, again, I don't know if we've talked about this before, but the scream is actually just a manifestation of the anguish he felt when his sister was incarcerated in an asylum. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, the sort of madness that I've always felt, that there must be something personal to it all. But actually, in terms of um, commonalities between paintings by the same artist, you know, that swirling water, as you describe it, that fluidity yeah. around the Madonna here, you know, that there are similarities, I guess, to this and the scream. But where the scream is anguish, perhaps in this one, I don't know if there's anything of benevolence, but that there is a, a sense of something of pleasure. Oh, interesting. I, I didn't interpret it that way, but you could be right. It's not about being I, right. There's also, there's also uh, something about the, her face is, is pastier than the rest of her body. Mm. You know, in the, in the colors and tones that were chosen. You know, it really, um, later, someone like Molina Dumas, the painter, the way that yep. she paints the faces, the kind of pasty, flaccid faces yeah. that are haunted and dead. Um, you know, I think Monk in, in this work is kind of nailing that. And again, it's about the relationship always between death and sex, between something that is allowed or not, something that is oblique or obscure and something so obvious. And I just want to read what he described the Madonna as himself. Um, he said that she creates a pause when the world stops revolving, your lips as red as ripening fruit, gently past as if, sorry, gently part as if, as if in pain. Now the hand of death touches life. The chain is forged that links the thorns, the families that are dead to the thousand generations to come. So to Monk, this was a painting that connected life with death, that there was something, this idea of ripening fruit in the lips, sure. the kind of fecundity in that beauty. There is, there is something of this painting that sort of draws you in in a dangerous way back to your original title of this whole thing. But mm -hmm. there, there's definitely a sort of a temptress of death kind of element to this. Oh, she's From quite um, vampiric. Yeah. But, you know, is Salome vampiric? You know, again, there's just something about it for me that... <gasps> <laughs> the common... I just have yeah. to say it again because I don't think we paid enough attention to it and it is so beautiful to me on the curl on the arm, that hair, the way it's- See, it's interesting that that's the curl you pick. I pick the curl on her face. Yeah, but it's the, again, this idea of 
well, both of them, I suppose, are painted in tenderness. Apparently you like men with curly hair is what it is. <laughs> Actually, I do. Um, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, I just think this is so soft. And yet it's, it's ghoulish, ghastly. It's a head on a plate. Yeah, I know. See, it's funny. You see this as all of those things. I see it as a young girl who thinks, oh my God, what did I do? Yeah, it's interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, she is pulling away, we could, we could say. And she too is pulling away. Yeah. Or something's pulling her away. But they're both don't dangerous. See her hands. They're both dangerous oh, yeah. symbols of femaleness. Well, because there are women and there's red in the painting, so it has to be dangerous. No, you're right. This one is scarier to me. The dangerous beauty is the thing that, you know, brings the siren out, wrecks the sailors on the rocks. Yep, this you know, is it, definitely fits into that. Well, I know, but does this one? No, that's just a young girl. Mm, okay. So this is not a young girl. No, I mean, I'm sure she's, she's, she's not old like us, but she's, you know. Just speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> old like us, my goodness. Yeah. It's interesting, the hair is interesting too. It's very, in many ways, this, this painting, this, woman in this painting is very modern looking to, to me mm. well and also there are lots of different versions in the um there's another one that's got a tiny kind of little homunculus fetus type thing oh, down weird. in the corner it's very disturbing yeah i don't need to see that one mm. anyway bill wadman thank you sandy that was fun don't go overboard now no, I'm saying no, like always a delight talking to you about things. I always love when I walk in and I'm like, I have no idea what I'm going to say about these things. Well, no, do I have the time? Mm -hmm. How many notes do you have in front of you right now? <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Probably still have got some facts wrong. Fact check me, everybody. No, don't definitely don't do that. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye.